Howdy. So far, we've helped you uh, find yourself in a lost situation. That is, at least keep your head on straight and wait until people come get you. We've helped you build a survival kit, given you several ways of building a fire, and even shown you several ways of building shelter. Now we're going to feed your belly. My name is Lee Robertson, training officer for the Utah State Division of Wildlife Resources, and would like to welcome you again to the fifth in our series of uh, wilderness survival. And as you can see, we're standing at the uh, water's edge of a dead lake. We're going to be talking about both edible plants and animals during this program. We'll be covering areas all the way from here in the Alpine Mountains out into the desert floor and many areas in between to show you those plants or animals that would be available to you, easily identified, that you could use to put a little something in the stomach to, uh, again, feed the furnace there to ward off that hypothermia, produce the necessary body heat. Well, in starting off, let's first of all explain, again, this program was designed for you, the layman, the average hiker, backpacker, hunter, camper, fisherman, and is uh, certainly not designed in any way to serve as an advanced program on survival. Therefore, our attempt here in showing you both the animals and the plants that you can use will be those that the average person can identify. We'll not get very technical at all, but we'll keep our instruction down to those few basic plants or animals that everybody can identify. Now, as we mentioned, this is a dead lake. They call it a dead lake. It really isn't. In just a few minutes that I was here this morning, looking around the lake shore, foraging a little bit, I have found a number of things that could have been eaten. First of all, out in the grass, I found a small garter snake. And you'll find this type of activity around most water. This type of animal needs water like anything else, and it'll come to water. And you'll find quite often in the mornings and the evenings find a lot of activity of uh, a number of snakes near water. Snakes, however, have a, a, a cold-blooded nervous system and cannot stand extremes of heat. Therefore, in the middle of the day, you'd not expect to find these near water, but sheltered up under rocks in the shade where they can protect themselves from the sun. Now, later on in uh, our program, we'll be showing you how we can uh, cook snake. We're going to cook a rattlesnake on a stick. When we go out in the desert, we're going to try to find you a rattlesnake. So rather than hold this little fella any longer, I'm just going to turn him loose and let him have his own way. A little later, I was uh, foraging around here in the water's edge and found that there were thousands of little frogs jumping off here into the water, off the rocks, and I very quickly captured a very small one and a medium-sized one that could be used in a uh, wildlife mulligan. Now, a wildlife mulligan, I should explain, as I put my little pal back in the water here, wildlife mulligan is nothing but a number of small animals that could be uh, put together with some edible plants in the metal can that uh, you have in your survival kit and used to cook up a, what we call a stew or a wildlife mulligan. I should caution you, however, we're dealing with very small animals here. And whether they be small birds or like my small buddy the snake or the frogs that we were using here, any small critter, if you clean them and remove the entrails, there isn't much left. Now that should warn you for what I'm about to tell you next. In using small animals, try to use the whole animal. Now I say try. I know that to some of you, this may not be mentally acceptable. But there's far more nourishment in the entrails of those small animals than there would be in, uh, say, just what little flesh remained on the animal after you had cleaned it out. So my advice would be, for those small animals or birds that you may use, chop them up into very small pieces, just put them in with your wildlife mulligan, Cook them all together, entrails and all, and then if you can, close your eyes and swallow hard and see if you can keep it down. Like I say, you're going to get an awful lot more nourishment from something like that than if you just use what little flesh was on the body after you cleaned it. Now, as you can see, for wildlife, the lake is not dead. There are wildlife uh, critters of all types all around the edge. But in the water, there's also something very edible. Probably my favorite of all the water plants, and remember we talked earlier 
that wherever you're around water, you're going to find water plants galore, most of which will be edible. My favorite of all the water plants would be algae. Algae is this green, slimy, foamy stuff you see floating on still water or slow-moving water. Now, that alone is enough to turn the stomach of most people, being green and being slimy. And I should mention that not only is the algae edible, but the plankton in the algae is also edible. Plankton is the thousands of forms of microscopical animal life that you'll see inside the algae, using algae for its natural life uh, environment. So not only are you taking in vegetation, but you're taking in a large amount of protein in the plankton that you're eating. Now taking algae from, say this, a rather dead lake, and we call it dead because it has no inlet stream or no outlet stream to keep the water fresh. And so the water is considered dead as far as being a running, running body of water. If you wouldn't want to drink the water, if the water was stagnant or polluted or in some way you wouldn't want to drink from that particular lake, then I would advise that you do not eat the algae direct from the lake. Any fresh or slow moving water where you could drink or would feel comfortable in drinking the water, then yes, go ahead and eat the algae fresh from the water. But if you still wish to use the algae from a dead lake, it can be put in a can of water and boiled as you'd purify the water for drinking. And you can lay it here on a flat rock and let the sun dry it and purify it. Now there's one problem with eating algae from a rather still body of water. There are rare occasions when a person gets a case of liver fluke from this uh, particular source. And a lot of people say, uh, oh boy, that, that's dangerous. Well, so is starvation, partner. And there uh, is a very small chance of liver fluke, but believe you me, that can be treated. I'm going to get in here and I'm going to get myself something to eat because right now my immediate threat is keeping enough fuel into my furnace to keep me alive, to ward off hypothermia and the many problems that are related with that. Okay, while we're drying our algae then, let's walk around and uh, have a look at some other edible plants and animals in different parts of the state. Before we cook, we're going to have to have something to cook. We're going to show you several real good snare devices that have worked very well for us. This one, a fork stick stuck in the side of the ground with a trip stick weighted on one end and held to the ground on the other end with a fork stick driven into the ground upside down like a stake. From the end of this, hanging over a game trail, we have a slip noose. The slip noose is allowed to collapse or relax around the animal as it passes through this, and the slightest tug either way will cause the stick to release itself from beneath the stake, and the weight of the other end will lift it off the ground and uh, hopefully choke the animal uh, very quickly to an easy death. This, of course, is much the same idea, only using the springy limb or sapling that's beside the trail to activate the snare. The trigger device, again, is uh, just two forked sticks, one caught under the other, driven into the ground, and the slip noose, again, along the game trail that will uh, capture the animal as it attempts to pass along the game trail. A pull either direction will cause this, like the other snare, to pull loose very quickly, releasing it to be yanked off the ground by the springiness of the limb or the sapling on the side of the trail. Both of these have worked very well and require nothing more than a piece of string or nylon line and a pocket knife with a couple of sticks to set. Here we're showing you a very successful double stake snare, two sticks pointed on one end, notched on the other, about one inch down from the top. These are then driven into the ground, straddling a game trail, so the notches face the center. Notice the notch on the left facing the center about one inch down from the top. We cut a straight, smooth stick that'll just fit between the two notches. This then is uh, fitted to the notches very carefully and a slip noose tied to the straight stick. This is allowed to relax across the trail or down in front of the trail and the other end is then fastened to a springy limb or a green sapling beside the trail. Once the slip noose is set, the snare is ready to camouflage. Now often the animals will see the snare and will attempt to go around it, but a little camouflaging of some uh, pine boughs or brush along either side will usually discourage that. And once camouflaged, the animal will attempt to go through it rather than jump over or around it. To test this, I slip my hand inside the slip noose. Just the slightest movement caused it to collapse around the wrist, a jerk 
on either way, either direction, cause it to lift off the ground. In the wintertime, tracks will lead you to dens, usually rabbit tracks, into rabbit dens. Here we found a very active den. We fastened together a piece of white nylon line that camouflages easily against the snow into a slip noose. This is then suspended from pine needles hanging just a few inches out from the entrance to the den. The bottom of the slip noose is about two inches above the snow, so the animal's feet will go under the slip noose, the head into the slip noose. The slightest pull on this will cause it to slip off the pine needles that's supporting the weight of this very lightweight line. A slight pull of the animal on this will cause it to collapse around the neck, and this is the end result. Meat in the pot tonight, a good dinner. This snare device is held up by only two pointed sticks suspended by a twig, and when an animal or bird jumps down into this, it'll cause them to collapse, dropping the rock or uh, cover over the hole, capturing the animal inside. This, an octagon, hexagon shaped snare device, has a series of small slip nooses, snares, fastened in a circle around, so that any animal attempting to crawl into this, or birds that may fly down in and then attempt to hop out from between these sticks, will get caught into these slip nooses, one or the other, as they attempt to go in or escape out. Again, the slip noose is allowed to collapse easily over the animal and becomes very, very effective. The bait placed in the center is quite a drawing card. Here, the tree snare works most effective for birds and small animals such as squirrels or chipmunks that would run up and down the tree to take our bait. It works like this. A hole is cut through the tree. An artificial limb is placed into the hole so that any bird or small animal that puts its weight on this limb will cause it to fall out of the hole, releasing the snare device to capture the animal and pull it up against the tree. We must dig a hole through the tree trunk, thus we choose a small tree. The knot is the trigger device, activated by a green limb. We cut a hole through the tree with a pocket knife, trimming a forked stick about 8 to 10 inches long, in a tapered shape on the heavy end, we then fit it to one, one side of the hole in the tree trunk. This may require a little enlarging of the hole to a taper shape. Here we're fitting it very carefully so that the limb will hold its own weight, but any animal, bird or four-legged animal, that attempts to put its weight on this will cause it to collapse. On the opposite side of the tree and just under the hole, we tie a heavy springy limb. On the other end of this limb, we tie a piece of nylon line into a loop. Notice, this is not a slip noose, but a loop with a fixed knot. The knot is pulled through the hole to the opposite side, the snare side, and then the artificial limb placed in the hole to keep the knot in place. The loop is then opened out, held open by the forked stick, and baited. This then is the completed snare, ready to activate. Any small animal or bird that attempts to land on this, this is the end result. Just like a bolt of lightning, it'll snap that animal up against the tree, and we've got dinner. But here we, we show the bait on the tree trunk. Squirrels and chipmunks can steal your bait there and get away from it. Put it out on the limb. Out in the desert country, we often find lizards, large quantities of lizards, sunning themselves on the rocks. And with a wide brim of a hat or a piece of sagebrush, like a fly swatter, you can quickly stun the animal or kill it outright and gather large quantities of these in just a very short period of time. And like the little uh, toads or frogs or small snakes or birds, we can make ourselves a wildlife mulligan. Snakes are also a very good item in the desert. Any snake is edible. We're attempting to find a rattlesnake here so that we can show you how to handle the most dangerous of all, the rattlesnake. Dangerous, the most dangerous of all in our western country at least, here the rattlesnake will often attempt to escape you if he uh, knows that your presence is near. Or he'll just lay under rocks and buzz, sometimes lay quiet. So it takes some careful looking to find him. With a forked stick, with just a very short stubby fork on one end, searching around through the rocks, when you find an animal, you may not find him in a convenient spot to work on. Avoid getting involved in a lot of loose rocks where you don't have good control of the animal. Slip one fork of the stick under the animal's body, lift him off the ground quickly. He won't attempt to crawl away. He doesn't have much security there on the stick. And he must use his ribs as legs to walk. And then with the forked end of the stick, pin his head to the ground, 
carefully slide the hand up behind the jaws of the snake, and poisonous snakes have very wide jaws. And with the hand held in this position, the snake cannot turn the head sideways to strike you. Here we're showing this animal is plenty active. The fangs have uh, extruded the venom over this forked stick. Lay the stick on the ground and with a pocket knife, sever the head from the animal very quickly. Get this dangerous part of the animal removed as quick as possible. And because this snake has a cold-blooded nervous system, the animal's head can bite or chew or inject venom from the fangs for hours after the snake has been killed. We're going to dispose of that head very carefully, lifting it and dropping it into a hole, covering it with a rock, so the other animals attempting to come by and maybe attempt to eat or chew on the head will not be involved in a snake bite. Running a knife up the belly, up the underside, we can then clean it as we would clean a fish, pulling the long stringy entrails out from the body. Here we can remove the entrails and throw them away because this single animal will provide a man a good meal by just eating the meat from down along the backbone, that real heavy layer of meat along the back. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, snakes are very edible, but the cold-blooded system allows them to move for many uh, long periods of time after the animal has been killed. Removing the skin is just like pulling a sock off your foot inside out. It'll adhere quite tightly to the tail, and you may there just prefer to take a knife and sever that part of the tail from the body. There's very little meat to be had there. Now we have ourselves a very nice, clean, very light white, pale pink piece of meat. It needs only washing now and wrapped around a stick for cooking. Our capture stick will serve very nicely here. We'll take that with us. Again, remember, this animal has a cold-blooded nervous system and will move. Don't be at all surprised if the body continues to move when you touch it into cold water. We wash it thoroughly. And then, like cooking a twist, a dough twist on a stick, as we did in the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, we just wrap it around a stick, fastening both ends to the stick with a piece of wire or a tack out of the survival kit. This holds the meat exposed to the hot, radiant heat of our campfire and can be cooked very, very easily without utensils. That is going to make me a nice meal. And it even smells good cooking. Many people ask what snake tastes like because they feel it's one of the most undesirable things they could eat, snake. Well, if I could compare it to any known or commonly eaten substance or meat, I would say it tastes very much like real good southern fried chicken. And it has a little smoky flavor from having cooked it over the open campfire. It'll be hot, so be careful. Take only just small bits at a time. The rest can be put back over the fire if you feel it needs additional cooking. And oh, that is finger licking good. Delicious meat. There'll be meat amongst the ribs, but very little. The heaviest meat will be right along the backbone. Other animals, small animals, such as squirrels, chipmunks, porcupines, rabbits, can be cooked without utensils by just suspending it over a rock, uh, even without the use of a stick, and allowing the hot, radiant heat of the fire to cook it slowly, cooking it clear through, well done without burning. And while it's cooking, you might catch a little catnap or two along the way. All of these small animals are edible. Here we see some edible plants. Pinion trees provide lots of pine nuts, lots of pine nuts after a frost, the pine nuts will open, they'll drop to the ground. Juniper berries, from the, what we in the West call the cedar tree, can be boiled in water to remove the heavy tannic acid and like the inner bark of trees. Once the tannic acid is removed, the bitter taste is removed, it's edible. Here we're showing you peeling bark off an aspen tree and taking one of those bite sizes of the cambium layer of the aspen off. And please remember, use only just small patches cut free such as this. Don't trim clear around the tree because you'll cut the circulation of the tree and kill it. Small patches here and there is really all you really need. Bark can be eaten right from the evergreen trees and usually isn't too bitter. 
But if you find one of these that is extremely bitter, boil the bark. Boiling the bark will allow you to eat much of it without reaching the saturation point of tannic acid. This should be avoided at all costs. In streams or moving water, we'll often find, other than just algae, large quantities of moss. Here we see moss hanging from rocks, off deadfall wood, tree trunks, even along the earthen banks. Moss is edible, all forms of water moss, and can be taken loose very easily and washed thoroughly in the fast-moving water. This removes all the debris from the root structure clean it up so that not only are the roots edible, but the green foliage of the moss itself, tasting just a little bit like uh, mature celery or lettuce, and is all edible. Wildflowers, the blossoms of most wildflowers can be eaten, but some are known to be irritable or poisonous. Look at your manuals for instructions on identifying these plants. Eat just a little bit. If it doesn't bother the stomach, eat a little more. Cactus, the inner part of cactus, Barrel cactus, prickly pear cactus, any of the cactus plants on the desert has a soft, pulpy inner part, and once opened up with a pocket knife, this can be gathered without getting any of the spines into the fingers. Another plant commonly found in much of the West is what is commonly referred to here as Mormon or Brigham tea. It looks much like small green shoots of bamboo, and it, like other plants, can be gathered in large quantities and wrapped in a handkerchief, a piece of cloth, a plastic bag or a piece of aluminum foil out of the survival kit and carried back to camp for use at a later time. Again, remember, refer to your manuals, your uh, plant identification manuals and survival manuals to be sure of the plant you're using. Water can be gathered in many places in areas where it's not visible. At the base of sheer sandstone cliffs where slick rock will drain water to the bottom, green layers of vegetation will be formed here or at the base of dry stream bed or at the base of a sloping hill or sometimes on the upper part of the hill where the broken strata of rock exposes a green band of vegetation. But in areas where we don't have this, a water still is the only out. This is constructed by digging a hole in the earthen floor uh, about three feet wide and three feet deep. This is going to require digging so a good stick here will help a piece of plastic to radiate the sun's heat inside the hole, a piece of aluminum foil to form into a cup or a catch bowl, and a piece of surgical tubing that will serve as a drinking tube later on. With our stick, we're going to have to dig a hole, as we said, about three feet across, three feet deep. Try to choose an area of loose soil. Avoid rocks. This uh, hampers the digging process, and there'll be very little water or moisture in a rocky area. So try to get into a good earthen area of soft dirt. In the heat of the desert, try to do this early in the morning or in the evening. Avoid doing this in the middle of the day when it'll cause severe body perspiration or sweating because we certainly don't want to uh, overexert ourselves under the heat of the desert or to cause the, the sweating to further dehydrate the body, losing the body moisture. As we get down deep into the hole, we'll find that we can actually smell in some cases or feel the coolness, the dampness of the soil as we get down deep into the hole. This is further proof that the vapor given off in this damp soil is going to provide us water. Folding our aluminum uh, catch bowl, we place it right in the center in the bottom of our hole, directly under where the rock will be suspended on the plastic, forming a dimple or a point in the plastic. We place our surgical tube into this uh, catch container or the bowl so the one open end is down inside where water can be sucked from this as it begins to uh, accumulate. The plastic is stretched over the hole, held in place by the, the loose dirt that's been dug from the hole, keeping it outstretched loosely. We then take a rock and place it right in the middle, directly over the top of our catch bowl, causing the plastic then to form a dimple or pointed downward so that the, the moisture will uh, gather, run to the point, and drip off, tying a knot in the end of our surgical tubing to keep air from circulating down in, our water still is now ready to perform for us. And again, the vapor condenses on the underside of the plastic, runs to the point, and drips into the cup. This is a good source of water. Well, sir, we've had a wonderful time together, at least I have, in uh, working with you in wilderness survival of all aspects. 
uh, we're back here at our spot where we laid our algae out to dry and uh, would like to mention that in survival wilderness survival please follow in the order that we presented our programs here if you find yourself confused admit you're lost immediately sit down and build a fire while you're sitting there comfortable comfortable and calm around your fire take an inventory of all the things you may have on your person that'll help you survive remember we're going to be there about seven days and prepare for that period of time then look for a good area where you can build a shelter find a good sheltered area where you've got plenty of firewood adequate firewood preferably close to a water supply freshwater stream or spring or nothing more than a dead lake where you can boil water and purify it and close to a source of food and again we re remember uh, earlier in the program we talked that wherever you find water you're going to find food then lay out ground to air signals those of you that sent in for the information we offered earlier in the program were sent a set of ground to air signals and we'd like to have you pack not only a copy of that in your wallet but one in your survival kit so that it's always available lay out ground to air signal because our most effective means of searching for lost people is by aerial search weather permitting we're going to be out in the air immediately looking for any sign of the person and uh, the ground to air signals as you'll notice are all straight line signals that from the air can be very quickly identified as being man-made then stay put relax the search parties will be in and get you out at their various very earliest opportunity well again i thank you for being with us I have really enjoyed working with you and hope that our information here will enable some of you, any of you, all of you, who may go into the out of doors and get yourself lost, make an enjoyable experience out of it instead of a bad one. Thank you very much and we'll see you again.